today's scripture. Today's scripture is from 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 6 to 23. Now Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men who were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand. And all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait at, as at this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul. I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to summon Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob. And all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Here now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword, and he inquired of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king, And who among all your servants is so faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law and the captain over your bodyguard and honoured in your house? Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, You, turn and strike the priests. And Doeg the Adamite turned and struck down the priests. And he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen effort. Now Nob, and Nob, the city of the priests, he put to the sword, both men and women, child and infant, ox, donkey and sheep, he put to the sword. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abietta, escaped and fled after David. And Abietta told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abietta, I knew on that day when Dog the Edomite was there that he will surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me, do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safe keeping. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, today as we read and hear the, your word read, these are not just plain words, but the account and the events and the people 
are real and it has happened. And indeed, Lord, it's into the darkness of our soul, no matter what that may be, things that will draw us away from you, no matter how good, how pleasurable, how fantastic, how beneficial, how helpful, Lord, they can only churn us more and more into darkness and we cannot see you clearly. So God, I pray that may this passage, as we look into it together as your people, may this give light to us into the darkness of our hearts and of all that may be going on in us and even around us for that matter. But we know you are the God of light. And in your word is light. And your word is a light to our feet. A, a, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Indeed, Lord, we ask of you. Holy Spirit, you will stir us and draw us to you. That you will enable us and empower us to hear again your word that speak into our own darkness. Help us, O oh God, so that in the process, we will learn to align ourselves to you in your word, that we might continue to follow you closely, to become the person, the disciple you want us to be. Come, not just to do many things, but to become who we are in you. So Lord, help us. For I pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, the Bible don't spare us the only very nice, rosy picture. But it also tells us and records for us dark moments. Or you can say, just like the title today, Into the Darkness. The Bible is God's word to us and it speaks to the realities in all aspects of our lives, in different ways, in different levels, in different seasons, in different levels of maturity. So you can say, God knows where we are, what we need, and what we can become with all the gifts and resources that He has given to us. So as we look at today's passage, yes, yeah, today's passage is a dark passage. I mean, you don't see it being read in anniversary, right? <laughs> so nobody will read this passage in an anniversary or birthday or in a celebration of a new birth. No. But today is a good day for us to look at this passage because we are studying the book of 1 Samuel. I cannot escape this passage. You cannot escape this passage in hearing and also in the proclamation of the word. You know, today's passage, as I can summarize it, it's about God speaking into the darkness of the worst of times and under the most calamitous circumstances, people go in the opposite direction seeking extreme solutions. But God is still at work behind the scenes accomplishing His purpose. Most obviously, God is at work in the text to bring His prophetic word to fruition. The Word of God has a prophetic element. There's a reason why you and I can learn God's Word and to learn that God's Word can direct our life towards the destiny, the purpose that He has for us. A little girl was walking in the house at night in the hallway and she came to a place where there is, uh, you know, some houses has uh, a ground floor, you know, where it, they, they, they make it a store, you know. And, and of course, the door was open, you know, looking down. She saw it's all darkness. And at the same time, she heard some noise. <laughs> uh, and that, on that ground, on that store. So in, in, in that, she just burst out saying, who is there? And then her daddy said, It's me, daddy. She replied, Well, I want to come down to you to be with you. 
the little girl said to the father. And he answered, Well, you can't just come down because I've taken the ladder away. But if you will jump, I will catch you. So now this was a little girl and she thought, jump down into that hole in darkness. You see, her father could see her, but, she, but because she was in the light, but she could not see the father because she was, he was down there in darkness. And she said, but daddy, I can't see you. Now darling, wait a minute. This is what the father said to her little girl, her, his little girl. I want to ask you a series of questions. Wow, okay. Do you believe I'm down here? Of course, the girl will say, Abu Deng, sure, you are down there. I, I'm talking with you. Do you believe I'm strong enough to catch you? Yes, I believe you are strong enough to catch me. Okay, he said, do you believe that I love you? Yes, daddy, I believe that you love me very much. He asked, have I ever told you a lie? No, you have never told me a lie. Okay, you know I'm here, down, down here, and you know that I love you very much. I would never lie to you. Now, jump. And she said, okay, daddy, here I come. She stepped off into the little black hole, and her daddy actually caught her and gave her a hug and sat her down. Believe it or not, my friends, that's what faith is all about. Yes, we are not talking about blind faith. We are not just, 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 just do it. But we're talking about a series of, if you call it, faith verification of who God is and who God is to you. We know that God is there even in the most hopeless situation of our life in darkness. And God speaks to us down inside, actually. We recognize He cannot lie. In God, there is no evil. So in the event, you think God is like to play hide-and-seek game and uh, nothing much to do because He's so free, <laughs> because He's God, He's he just playing you know, like chess of each of our lives. No, God never view evil. Just like God never lie. We believe in His strength. And most of all, we believe that He loves you and I very much. Not in general, but love you and I very much because He knew you just like He knew me. So when He say go, we go. When He say jump, we jump. When He say leap, we leap. So with that, Let's look at the first lesson in this amazing God that calls us to Himself. Remember, God called us to Himself. God never called us to do things for Him from the first place. That is our response of God's calling us to Himself. That's why in our response, we do many things. Whatever we do should not replace of the calling of God to each and every one of us personally. That's why the knowledge in Jeremiah 1.5, for me, when God knew me before I was born, is very significant for me. Because it tells me God is very interested in me even before I was born. He was already thinking of me. At that time, my, he also knew that my name will be given with Chin Shen Long. Then later on, Thomas Chin Shen Long. He knew. Even before he called me and I responded to be a pastor, he knew me as a person. And he loved me as a person, not love me because I'm a pastor. And this is very important, my friends. God called us to Himself 
And in our response, we follow. And that's why the first lesson, as we look at this passage, into the darkness, in the context of God who loved us, the God who speaks, the God who is at work in every way, of course, God's word is certain and true. Even in the midst of, you will ask me, if it ever happened to any place, a national, for me, like to Israel, it's a national tragedy. A king ordered a massacre. A, a massacre. And you can, can you imagine the intrigue thing? The passage tells us even the soldier do not dare to raise a hand except this Edomite. Perhaps you want to gain favor somehow, special place in the sight of Saul. He take advantage, political advantage of that situation. The whole city was slaughtered. Into that kind of terrible situation. What does that mean? It tells us God's word is certain and true. And we look at it. In fact, the overarching theme, even right from the beginning of the book of Samuel, is God's word is certain and true. And it's very clearly illustrated in the death of the elite priest at Nob. And further down the line later, when the last member of that family will be removed from the priestly office. And we'll go to that. The narrative tells us how God brought His word concerning Eli's priesthood to fulfillment. The end of Eli's priesthood to fulfillment. While David finds protection and provision in exile, Saul gives this ludicrous command to execute the priest at Nob. It looked like a desperate act of a godless king. But when we follow the narrative earlier, actually, you and I have the insight to see that this is to fulfill God's word concerning Eli and his family who actually rebel against God and disobedience to him when they serve God in the temple. We can find it in the earlier part of 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I want to take excerpt from verses 27 to 36. And we want to read this together. Okay? We will follow slowly, okay? Uh, let's read this one first. There are three short portions. Together? Then in distress, you will look with envious eyes on all the prosperity that shall bestow on Israel. There shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of whom I shall cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out to grieve his heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of man. And this that come upon your two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, shall be the signs to you both that them shall die on the same day. The ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Phinehas, died. He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hopni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy. He judged Israel 40 years. A lot of details here you must catch, and you can imagine the size of Eli. Okay? So, what was captured by us in just few verses, you have to go back to read chapter 2 and all is to tell us very clearly that God's word is certain and true. And the death of the priesthood, even the town, the descendants, actually is fulfillment of the prophecy of God upon Eli's family. I know we don't like to hear these words, but we need to hear again 
this lesson that God's word is certain and true. Increasingly, the trustworthiness of God in His word is being challenged by an age that rejects the idea of truth as absolute and purely rational. All of us are affected with this way of thinking. One of the things that we do is we become very selective when we come to learning the truth and the lessons from the Bible. What suits me, I do. What don't suit me, ignore. Or, I don't know, there are many ways of describing. Let it blow to the wind, you know. Uh, we, 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 we will do some other things and, and keep on, the list will go. So we become very selective. So one of the reasons why we preach through the books of the Bible is that you cannot escape passages. <laughs> Preacher and also congregation alike. We need to deal with it because the Bible is written for a reason and we must learn the purpose is set by the author, by also the Holy Spirit, first of all. So in the age that reject truth as absolute and also purely rational, it's very, very, I would say, dangerous for us not to trust God's word as worthy. That's the reason why sometimes we, we, we also do, do not fall in love with the Word of God. Sometimes when you read the Word of God, ah, yeah, I don't understand. Nah. Okay. But then, we like to see YouTube will tell us, offers instant answer. By the way, YouTube is a good communication skill, but there's a lot, a lot of trash in YouTube. Okay? Let me see. Let me say it again. Because there are things that people claim, almost they are, they are, like, they are, they are able to, to decipher, to, to say things clearly. Fantastic. But always check the basis of many of what they say. I got people come to me and argue with me based on YouTube. Seriously. Because it's really make-believe. I cannot be like YouTube. I cannot do TikTok, you know, to preach, you know, to, to be such entertaining. I mean, I, I, I wish I learned a bit of the skill, but nobody taught me, you know. If I do it, probably disastrous. You will end up looking at me in a funny way and all you can remember for the rest of the year. Everything else that I say and preach, you cannot remember anymore. But I'm just saying that it's important for us to look at that. But yet, on the other hand, some of them, oh, yeah, got to study the Bible, got to read the Bible, got to really uh, uh, learn how to apply the Bible, not to share with one another, you know, some of these things. Wow, too much work. I don't have time. So there is this another way, another extreme, that just based on emotions and intuition. Wow, today I feel that God is so real to me and so near. Wow, He must be very powerful. So you pray very, very long. So one day you wake up, uh, wow, like the whole world has crashed on you because everything crashed. Even the market also crashed. You also crash. So you feel, feel like praying. You may feel like cursing God, but you don't dare to curse God because He's God. No, where is the reverence? So you, you begin to swing from the other extreme to just based on emotion. Whatever feel good is good. Whatever don't feel good, no good, or maybe bad, or you should turn around. I mean, this is another aspect of the age that we live in. We are not saying that feeling, emotion, intuitions are wrong, no but they must be tutored by the truth of God in His Word and who God is. The simple truth to learn is God is faithful to His Word. That's why His Word is certain and true. Such message comes as a comfort to those who believe and cause alarm to those who refuse to believe. Often we like to hear words of comfort in the Bible. Wonderful. But we selectively ignore the message that rebuked and confronts us in our sins and rejection of God and His ways. We must open 
be, remain open, my friends, in whatever situation. The Bible talks about spiritual eyes, enlightenment, like in Ephesians. Pray for the eyes of faith to see what God, who God is and what God is doing, has done and is doing in your life and around us. And to embrace the both effect of the comfort and the confrontation of God's Word upon our life, which is certain and true. So the question for us to reflect and apply is that in the midst of the darkness of our reluctance and resistance to follow God's way in His Word, in what ways are you opening your eyes in the light of God's Word? In what way are you allowing the light of God's Word to shine into what is going on in your life? Secondly, into the darkness, God's Word is evocative and transformative. The Word of God, on one hand, brings us comfort. The Word of God must, in also many ways, engage us and confront us in our life. Perhaps some of you say, oh, life is good. I'm quite a good person, by the way. You know, there's nothing. You know, much for me to even know that I'm, I, I'm in a wrong, wrong aspect or wrong way of relating to God. But think of a time when you're not able to give to God more fully as who He is, to trust Him. There's so many things in our life that we actually fall short of the standard and the glory of God has for us. That's why Romans 3, 23 always say that we are all fall short. Even when you don't feel that you have you are bad or you have not sinned. But there are some things in life that we actually be held from God. I don't know where are you at the moment in your life, but I pray that the Word of God has the power to evoke and transform you. See, in this passage, misery is a natural and inevitable consequence for those who choose not to be rightly related to God and His Word. It is only logical to conclude that we cannot believe in God without also believe in a destiny for those who do not want God. Let me repeat this phrase again. We cannot believe in God without also believing in a destiny for those who do not want God. So, basically it's saying to us, you either choose to believe or not to believe. If you choose to believe, this is the direction you are moving. If you choose not to believe, this is another direction. There is no in the middle. Either you believe, you believe to follow God or you, you don't follow God. So very clearly illustrated is the story today in David and Saul. That God's word is being evocative and transformative. For David, he responds to God's call and begin a lifelong process of transformation. You can see that subsequently in the many chapters in Samuel. While Saul is the figure who shows natural, inevitable consequences of refusing God's call, he started well. But he refused to respond to God's call again and again. It was not just one time. He was given many times to turn back to God. In the Bible text, the two are going in the opposite direction. You can actually read, you can actually sense it. This is captured more and more in the incre increasingly with each passing chapters. See, the contrast between David and Saul become more acutely clear in their reaction to the priest at no. That's very significant, this passage, because it really uh, clearly shows to us the contrast between David and Saul. You know, David actually regretfully blamed himself for the massacre. You can actually read it at the last part of the chapter. 
And this is what it says in verse 22. And David said to Abita, I knew on that day when Dog the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. He took the blame. Because in a way, he was part of that process. While ironically, Saul seems resolute in his condemnation of the priest. Even after the priest has explained themselves that this has nothing to do with them. Whatever Saul might have thought. Saul is ultimately responsible actually for the death. Though David humbly accept the blame. You and I know Saul is slowly and gradually self-destructing. You can see that in the unfolding of the many chapters to come. While David is successfully growing in strength and self-assurance. Both as a person and as a leader of the nation. This process will continue until Saul is dead and David is king. This much we know. Why? Because God's word has proclaimed it. My friends, you will say, ah, this is Saul, this is David, this is uh, Old Testament. But God is the same God. Jesus is the same today and the days to come. It's the same God who continue to be present with us. It's the same God that is actively working in our life and also speaking to us if we care to pay attention as we go back to His Word to understand and to apply the truth of His Word. So our destiny is related and tied to our responsiveness to God's Word and to obey the truth of His Word by applying them into our daily life. So a story told of a young boy who applied for a job in a local newspaper office. The manager asked him, can you type? Oh, no, sir, I cannot type, came the reply. Can you turn, can you run a printing press? Asked the manager. No, sir, I cannot run a printing press, came the answer back. Well, young man, what can you do? Well, very nice manager. The boys stood tall and smiled and said, I can do what I'm told to do, sir. I can do what I'm told to do, sir. With that reply, the young boy was hired. You wonder why this manager hired a person who don't have the skill <laughs> of typing, don't have the skill of running a printing press. The manager found that there's a place for him because he can do what he is asked to do and he follow it through. It was the posture, I believe, and the propensity of this young man who want to follow clear instruction that he was hired. When we come to God and His Word, our posture and propensity to obey God as we seek God with clarity in His Word evokes and transforms us. Not anything, but towards the likeness of Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit. And not only that, to be Christ-centered in the destiny that God has for each and every, wherever we are, in whatever station, whatever even we have done and doing. So our life in obeying God and the destiny moving forward is intricately linked. Just like we see in the unfolding of the life or the words 
or the passages that were given to us by, between David and Saul. So the question for us to reply and apply is, reflect and apply is, how would you set yourself in order to allow God and His Word to evoke and transform you into Christ's likeness and to feel His purpose in you? You know, I might capture that we are not here to buy time. <laughs> if you are thinking in that way, I challenge that. Come, go out for coffee with me. I want to talk to you. Not that I know what is God's ultimate destiny for you, but I believe I can give some pointer or two. And maybe others of our, like our lay leader and others who, who, whom you know, um, who, 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 who can help you and guide you. No, we are not here to buy time, my friend. We are here because we have a significant identity and the purpose that God has for us. And these two are very intricately linked. The gifts that God gives to you are intricately linked, what you are to become. The resources that God has bestowed on you, whether it's little as you perceive or whether it's a lot. Sometimes we have a lot also, we thought we are so little. Just like EMC, very much, it's not a review, but just a comment. We always thought EMC, EMC, many people thought EMC is small. Come with me, go to Kuala Peace. Then you understand what is a small church all about. The church only has three active members. These three active members are also LCEC. And sometimes you wonder why the church continues with such few people. Why? Because these three, three, three to four people, there is a vision. They are ministering to a bigger group of people from the teacher's training college. They come from East Malaysia. I've never seen a church huh, because of the need immediately in two months have a new service in Basa, Malaysia. I know because I'm the district superintendent of Pahang. I know because I go and visit them. And because I know these four people, three to four people over there. Why? Because they see whatever they do are intricately connected to the destiny that God has for them at that season, even at this moment. At this moment, they stop the service on Saturday. So now they concentrate on the service on Sunday morning that is Bahasa Malaysia, English, sometimes also chip in a little bit of Chinese. Why? Because the people there, basically more BM speaking. They also seek to reach out to the Orang Asli community. I say, wow. What a wonderful mindset, kingdom mindset of God with the little resources. My friend, EMC is not a small church. But of course, we are not proud and say, wow, no, we have so much. No, no let's recognize that. Just like sometimes we feel we are very small, we've got nothing to offer. No, not true. Even a little boy got something to offer. Even a little boy can pray, a little girl can pray. Even anyone can just offer a simple word of comfort to another because they may change. Move and align the direction of the person a little bit more towards God. Of course, not to say lah, sometimes if we don't control our mouth, if we vomit, um, not, I'm saying, not physical vomit, lah, poison, you know, terrible thing come out of our mouth, that also become very destructive. <laughs> so then we know how to check what is really going on in our heart. Why am I spilling out vomit and poison? <laughs> yeah, let me be very real. If I'm not careful, I also spit poison. I'm a very venomous snake. Maybe all of you are good snake. I'm not sure that there's a good snake or bad snake. Basically, we're all sinners. Lah. So yeah, we are capable. But I think the most important is how do we allow 
the word of God to tutor us, hone us, mold us by the power of the Holy Spirit that is in us. I would like to conclude with this quote by Oz Genius. The truth is not that God is finding us a place for our gifts. It will take, take a long time for you to just settle. The truth is not that God is finding us a place for our gifts. Okay? But that God has created us and our gifts for a place of His choosing. And we will only be ourselves when we are finally there. Talking about who we are, the all that we have, all that we are, all that we have coming together in the destiny that God is moving us towards. God has initiated and is present in our life. As we seek God and His Word and be responsive to Him, we will discover moments, I will say more and more moments of clarity that we are walking in His ways to accomplish His purpose. In so doing, you and I are participating in a grand movement of God's work in your family, in the family, in the church, in the workplace, in your neighborhood, in the nation, in the world. You are part of that grand movement that God is doing in His entire creation. My friend, you are not just a drop of water in the ocean mean nothing. No, our God is a great God. Our God is the one who knows us, a God who cares for us, a God that moved us if we are responsive to Him. I'd like to close this observation and my own experience in EMC. As I look back in the last five years and nine months, yeah, I calculated. It's five years and nine months. Today is 1st October. As a participant, then of course, I'm appointed as a pastor. I sense that I have fulfilled His purpose that has placed me in EMC, even due to human structure and all. I remember very clearly when I come here, I come here with a quite a clear purpose. That is to return the church to the biblical roots of discipleship and disciple making of all nations. Not that the church is not doing. Let me do a disclaimer. I'm just trying to put it together clearer as we move together by the Spirit of God. And currently, I can say, I hope only God knows all. I'm given a little opportunity to see glimpses, a significant movement that has also begun in many of your inner life and also many of the external life that we have, the story that I come to hear, the things that I observe as in the church. To disciple and to make disciple by a life on life, walking alongside with one another. Very intentionally, to a certain extent, Intending to build relationship. There's so much talk now among the LCC, how we can reach out to one another, how we want to continue to, to not only reach out to people outside the church, yes, we must, but to continue to also engage with people within the church. We also don't want to forget, especially those who, for whatever reason, are not coming to a physical meeting. Yeah, there are many concerns more than you can ever imagine. Because there are many people who are looking into this. Pray for them. Because these tasks are difficult. Because human beings are complex. And because they are complex, very complicated. And then of course, leading people to Christ is wonderful. There's so much effort all around in different levels, different ways just to lead people to Jesus, pointing people to Jesus, 
even in our activities, we are more conscious. Praise the Lord. And of course, we want to mature them to know God. Again, discipleship, disciple making for ministry in the church and the world. And by the way, that's our mission. I really felt a deep sense of gratitude. And I came here, I have no idea what would happen. But God has unfolded even with MCO. Sorry, by the way. We are able to hold together by the grace of God, the people of God as a church. That is no small feat, not because of me. It's God's Holy Spirit and power and work that knit our hearts together. Even in all the difficulty that we face with one another. And I'm truly thankful to God for that calling, for that conviction, and for that consecration that I can contribute to the life and ministry of the church in and through EMC. So what I'm trying to say is that whatever we decide, whatever we implement and do, or undo, redo, continue to do, to build that, does link to a sense of destiny and purpose that God has for us. I'm thankful that many of you have touched my lives which I've never imagined being a person that is very new to EMC as a pastor, not as a Christian follower. I'm giving that privilege. I'm thankful. But yet, many of you also embrace my weaknesses. No, I'm thankful. There's so much to thankful for. And when all these are linked together, just like what all his genius has said. So all this begin with allowing ourselves again to let God's word that is certain and true, to let God's word that evoke and transform and the Holy Spirit to work in and through us by the word of God. Of course, by God himself who constantly at work in us. Let us pray. Maybe just pause for a short moment. If God has spoken to you, do not wait. Just respond where you are to Him. Whatever they brought to attention in your mind, in your awareness. If it's not clear, ask God for clarity. That in time, He will show you what He wants to say to you. In and through His Word. And when you're ready, say a prayer of response to God. How you will want to follow Him tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, the week. As the Word of God and the Spirit of God tutor you, even right this moment. Because God's word always call for a response on our part. Yes, God, we come before you. We know that on our own we are weak. We are unable to even to respond to what you have said to us and asked of us. Strengthen us, Lord, in our weakness. That even a short while as we come to the table of communion with you and with one another. May this means of grace continue to empower us that we might continue to follow you more closely. We want to be your disciples. We want to mirror characteristic of your being your disciples in our life. We cannot do it on our own. But it is you. And as we let your spirit and your word tutor us, you will lead us that we truly experience transformation 
And as we align ourselves to accomplish all that you have called upon us at different season, different moment, different things, because you speak to us, you make that link and connection that we might become people standing tall, just like the young boy. All we want is, Lord, speak, your servant hears, and to follow what you say to us to do. So help us. And for this, I pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.